Hello, I'm Tim Sandal and uh, welcome to uh, my latest video on all things to do with coronavirus and this is the eighth video in the series and last time we looked at the risks surrounding return to work and reviewed the mitigating factors for those set to return to work in offices as well as some thoughts for home workers. In this um, video, we return to the core thoughts about the coronavirus itself. That's the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And we're going to look at the uh, aspects of viral infectivity. Specifically, this video is all about this R number concept, or more accurately, the R naught um, value. But we're also touched a little bit on how the virus infects. So to begin with, how infective is the virus? So to understand uh, viral infectivity, virologists do refer to the basic reproductive number, which is the average number of other people an infected person could go on to infect. And this is denoted as R0 or has more generally referred to in the media, the R number. However, importantly, it's not an exponential. It's only a potential number as regards infections. So R is a dimensionless number. It's not strictly the infection rate, and it does not relate to time or to any other parameter. So quoting R does not tell us how fast an infection will spread through a given community. And scientists calculate the R number through mathematical models. And the accuracy, as with any model, is reliant upon the quality of the data that is inputted. So just a quick aside, a number of people are re-watching or watching for the first time a movie called Contagion. And in this film, the methods used to calculate the R number for a fictitious disease are inaccurate. Because in this movie, they conflate the R number as an exponential, which is not right. And I'll loop back to that in, in, in just a minute. So with COVID-19... Um, the R number is quoted as somewhere between 2 and 3. And to put this into context, this is a far larger number than so the one associated with influenza, which averages at 1.3. So on one level, the larger the number, the more likely this could lead to an epidemic or on a larger global scale, a pandemic. Because it's an indicator of the uh, greater spread through a given community. However, the quoted R value can only be considered in the context of a time point in history. So, for example, if you take... Um, HIV and chickenpox, for example. These may well have the same R number, but to contract HIV, bodily fluids need to be shed. Whereas with chickenpox, the virus can be contracted by breathing in particles in the air. So they might have the same R number, but under general circumstances, chickenpox is far easier to contract. And also looping back to this reference of influenza with the 1.3 um, R value, um, it also stands that the R value for past outbreaks may well not be valid for outbreaks of the same disease at a future time point. So you need to treat comparisons made by the media with um, some degree of caution. This also relates to what I said at the beginning about the R value not being an exponential number. You cannot look at R naught value of two and conclude this means there will be two people infected today, four people infected tomorrow, eight the next day, and so on. 
This is because to understand the R value is just one part of a larger picture of data that needs to be uh, considered. So the overall picture is affected by time, by space, by society, the given community, and by the particular public policy measures that are put into place. And all of this is dynamic and subject to change. And we also need to take into account the means of viral transmission. So in terms of how deadly the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus is, estimates about the mortality rate vary. And this is partly a reflection of the highly variable nature of data collection, which varies within and between countries, plus differences in testing regimes. So a country like the UK, where I am, has been incredibly slow to introduce testing. And uh, my, my view is that it, that is the wrong decision that's been made by the uh, Johnson administration. And there's also factors about the accuracy of um, test kits as well. There's also vast differences between nations in terms of social policies put in place. And the R number can and will be modified through measures like social distancing, together with other public policy considerations. So this means that R is not a biological constant and different health policies can indeed alter it. It's also important that the R data is looked at over a long time period. And this is because there's um, the lag in reporting cases. We know the difference between cases reported on a Monday, which reflect the weekend, often need updating later in the week. And there's also natural delays with the onset of symptoms. So we need to consider uh, probably in wider society, there's a large number of asymptomatic carriers. Um, so it also stands that R is very general. So what it cannot do is tell us differences in terms of the infection rates between different settings. So for example, between a, a hospital and a care home and a workplace and a wider community, you can only quote a general R number. But in these different uh, community niches, the, uh, the infection rate may well be higher. We also need to be relatively nuanced um, in considering differences between the number of people who are currently infectious, as well as the recorded um, number of new infections. So consider this point, for example, as past infection rises, the effective R value falls as there are less people who can potentially become infected. But this drop in R doesn't mean there's a fall in the numbers who are infected. So that's another complexity to take into account. So we need to consider the proportion of the population that remains susceptible to future infection. So virologists also introduce a concept called endemic equilibrium, which is also an important factor to consider. So this means it can become quite challenging to get good estimates of the R number, and the figures issued by governments should not be considered at face value. As single events, um, we need to look at these, this concept of the wider trend. And some scientists also recommend, in addition to R, factor in other important data, such as the number of new cases, say, per 100,000 of the population across a given period of time. So if you want to read a bit more about the R number concept and why it's more complex than perhaps the media portray, then there's a good book which is called Mathematical and Statistical Estimation Approaches in Epidemiology, and it's edited by uh, Gerardo Chow and others. Now, we also need to consider how the virus spreads. Now, the primary way, as well established, is through water or mucus droplets, and these are passed on person to person. Second is direct contact, so from hand to an infected surface and then to uh, mouth, nose or eyes. 
Um, and we know from our, our previous videos that the viral RNA can be recovered from a variety of surfaces, including plastic and steel, and this is several days after um, the viral RNA has made contact with the surface and become deposited. What's less clear-cut is the potential for transmission via aerosols. And here, scientists at the US National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases have indicated that the virus is potentially stable in aerosols for up to three hours. So that's a larger spread of the virus through the air. But there are, again, as we've covered in um, other videos in this series, um, factors that can affect that, particularly with um, difference in temperatures and humidity that affect the potential for viral RNA survival. In relation to the infectivity of this particular virus, the SARS-CoV-2 virus, um, data indicates that it is probably between 10 and 20 times more likely to bind to the ACE2 receptors on human cells compared with the earlier SARS virus. Now the AC2 is this doorway as to how the virus gets into cells and cells in the lungs in particular, although there are also some in the gastrointestinal tract, have the ACE2 receptors and this is what the S protein spikes on the coronavirus used to attach to these receptors. And if you remember that the um, coronavirus is so named because of the spikes protruding from it, that's how the virus gets its name because it uh, resembles the corona of, of the sun. So once docked on, another protein in the human cell membranes called serine protease helps to internalize the virus. So essentially it provides the bridge to allow messenger RNA from the virus to enter and to infect the cell. And this greater binding helps to explain why SARS-CoV-2 can spread more readily compared to people, uh, compared to the original SARS virus of 2002-2003. Although it still was the ACE2 receptor that allowed the original SARS to jump into the cell, which is why we know that these, the current coronavirus is a natural formation. Um, medically, there is some research going on into blood pressure medications and whether that leads to greater infectivity for the virus. And this is because a number of common blood pressure hypertension uh, medications increase the number of ACE2 receptors on certain cells. So it's kind of presenting, in theory, more points of entry for the virus. And there was a paper published in the Lancet called Are Patients with Hypertension and Diabetes Mellitus at Increased Risk of COVID-19 Infection? And the authors here um, suggest, and in, in their conclusion to the paper, I quote, they say patients with cardiac diseases, hypertension or diabetes who are treated with ACE2 increasing drugs are at higher risk for severe COVID-19 infection and therefore should be monitored. However, in, in way of balance, this is not necessarily supported by all scientists, including those based at the European Society for Cardiology, and they have yet to find evidence that taking drugs that combat high blood pressure lead to higher infection rates. So the jury, to a degree, is out on this one, and it might be an area of further scientific evidence to emerge. And of course, very importantly, nobody who has prescribed a high blood pressure medication should stop taking it. And any aspects of that should be discussed with a qualified medical professional. OK, so that's it for this video. Our focus has generally been on what is the R number and a little bit of caution in how that number should be interpreted. And you can find seven other coronavirus related videos made by me on my YouTube channel. And please subscribe to the channel to get future updates. So that's it from me, Tim Sandal. And until next time, please stay safe.